uh, we now move on to the uh, 13th module of uh, this course in applied linguistics of the UGC program or program in, in linguistics. Uh, as you already know that Applied linguistics is a very wide area It examines all kinds of questions that will do in earlier times, um, say, in, I think since you know, people started teaching languages, we have seen applied linguistics in some sense or the other. Uh, and till recently, the focus of applied linguistics was on language teaching, but now, uh, the domain of applied linguistics really extends far beyond. Uh, particularly, there is an interface with computers, so we talk of computational linguistics, an interface with neurology, so we talk of neurolinguistics, and so on. I mean, there, where you know linguistics is applied. For example, people who want to sell products, you know. They want to understand what kind of accent, what kind of pronunciation to put in, what kind of copy line you know, they should have for their product. So they will involve linguists. So linguists are needed for uh, a variety of uh, jobs in different domains of human activity now. Uh, so it's a good idea to have a, a good grounding in linguistics because I don't think you can call yourself a good applied linguist unless you have solid foundations in in sort of basic linguistics itself. Only then you can you you can't you can't dream of applying something without having uh, you know fairly solid knowledge of uh, the basic what we might say formal aspects of language. And when I say formal, I mean you should know the formal aspects of phonology, morphology, and syntax. You know, this is an, and, and semantics. You know, these are the core areas that you should know uh, and how they are rule governed, you know, in what ways they are rule governed, and what is the range of variability that is allowed uh, there in a, in a specific language, and how those particular rules of a specific language tie up. They have to tell you with the universal grammar. Okay. So, uh, the point I am trying to make is that language gives you a kind of window onto the human mind which no other domain of knowledge can give you. And it gives you that window far, far too early than any other system of knowledge. So, in this uh, particular module, module number 13, uh, we will talk about the critical period hypothesis in some detail, which you already know about, and its implications for uh, second language learning or second language acquisition. That what what does critical period hypothesis mean, and uh, uh, what kind of implications does it have for language learning and therefore language teaching? Uh, that's the focus of this particular uh, module. Uh, as, you, as you already know, the hypothesis of critical period was initially given by people working at the University of McGill, uh, Penfield and Roberts, and they conducted a whole range of experiments and sort of proposed that, uh, you know, the, the critical period for learning language is between 0 to 14. And this was supported by, you know, children acquiring more and more languages, far greater ease than adult immigrants, for example, not being able to acquire uh, different languages with with same amount of ease and comfort. And there was a general kind of support for this kind of hypothesis, and it was argued that the plasticity of the human brain is lost after the teens. And initially been suggested by, uh, supported by Eric Lenneber uh, in his very famous book, uh, I forget the name, you will have it in your module, uh, Biological Foundations of Language, I think something like that. Uh, he suggested that the 
the ability to learn language, I mean, is sort of uh, disappears uh, after your teens. Once you're out of your teens, that means once you're 17 or 18, or once you're 20, uh, that's the end of the story. Very becomes very difficult. Uh, so far, generative grammar is concerned. So far, Chomskyan grammar is concerned. And uh, so far, contemporary evidence is concerned. Uh, it is true to say that your ability to learn a new language cannot disappear till the time you have access to your universal grammar. And it would appear that you have access to universal grammar till the time you live. Okay, I mean, till the time you become so old that you you become almost an aphasic or you have memory loss or you have schizophrenia, till the time you don't have those problems, you have access to universal grammar. Uh, and now as we talked about this in, the, in some other module, that uh, adult immigrants and adult wives from other areas when they are married into other families at distant places and many other adults who, who become, let's say, diplomats or bureaucrats, they learn uh, pretty fluently the target language. So uh, it's, not, it's, not very, it's not very sort of reliable or uh, it doesn't seem very appealing to say now that uh, we must stick to the critical period hypothesis. Uh, and uh, universal grammar, as you know, we did mention earlier, consists of certain principles and parameters. Uh, for example, there is a principle of structure dependency. All human languages, all human languages will have uh, hierarchically structured uh, sentences sentence forms, you can call them, uh, or hierarchically arranged syntactic structures, you might say, which means that you cannot get, you cannot get Y unless you subsume X at a different level. Okay, so there is a, that kind of relationship, and this is a relationship of dependency. For example, as we, as we, dis, as we indicated in the last module, uh, if you want to make a yes-no question or if you want to make a negative, let us say the boy who is, uh, the boy who, who is wearing a red shirt is eating an apple. The boy who is wearing a red shirt is eating an apple. Now there are two is, only one is can be fronted. It is the is with the in the main clause that means is eating an apple. So, is the boy who is wearing a red shirt eating an apple? Where will the negative go? The negative will go the boy who is wearing a red shirt isn't, is not eating an apple. So, the not is attracted to the auxiliary, to the helping verb of the main clause. Okay. Now, this is the principle. This is the principle that you, there have to be certain relationships of structure dependence. Uh, take, take an example of parameters. You can, you can have a parameter as, as we discussed earlier that languages can be verb initial or verb final. By verb initial we mean they could be verb medial or verb initial or they could be verb final. Verb final like uh, Hindi and uh, verb video like English. So that's a parameter. So it's a plus minus. You choose either this or that. Uh, there is also a parameter of uh, uh, prodrop, which is called the prodrop parameter. Uh, prodrop parameter means, let's say, in English, I cannot say uh, something like uh, went. I cannot say. Because of the simple reason that if I say went, it could be I went, he went, she went, they went, you know, 
it went, it could be anything. So you cannot drop the pronoun. But in Hindi, if you say Gai, that means only third person singular female. So you can drop. I can say in Hindi very comfortably Jaun, which can only mean one thing, that means I go. But can I go? Main jaun. That you can drop man because that man has already been copied onto jaun. So languages can be divided in terms of this plus minus road drop parameter. So this is are some of the basic principles of uh, uh, what you might say uh, the universal grammar, the principles and the, and the parameters. Uh, some some people believe, like Lenneberg, like Vancouver Roberts, that you know UG will never be available at a later age. But you know, as as you know, because the brain functions are different. Because if if children get brain injuries and children are operated on the brain, they might recover languages. They might learn new languages, but not so in the case of adults. Uh, Lenneberg also presented some neurological evidence in support of the critical period hypothesis, but none of which, in terms of, for example, the dominant hemisphere, that this hemisphere is dominant. If this gets damaged, then language will not be accessible. But all these have been shown to be not substantially supported by empirical evidence, and more and more research is going on into this area. There are definitely neurological networks which may you know, we might discover one day that our neurological uh, networks of the human brain correspond to some kind of fundamental principles of the universal grammar. But so far, that phenomena is open to inquiry and, and is being investigated by people. Uh, Rosinowski uh, was uh, of the opinion that there is cognitive development is responsible in second language learning and that there is a difference between learning the first language by children and first language by, uh, I'm sorry, second language by adults. When children learn, when children learn second language, they do not have the same kind of cognitive resources available as adults have. Adults have a tremendous knowledge of the world. Okay. They're, they're huge lexicon. Conceptual machinery is far more advanced, but children don't have that advantage, whereas adults have that. And adults also have a huge amount of cognitive flexibility, and they have far greater metalinguistic awareness. That means they can explicitly talk at least about some rules than, than children. So they have greater. So it, it might make sense to say that actually adults would make better language learner than children. You know, this might make some, some sense because, you know, they, they, uh, an adult is likely to learn a language that he or she wants to learn, like French or German. She chooses, let's say, German over French because she is more positively, she is more highly motivated to learn German and she is more positively inclined to learn German. So the issue of uh, issues of uh, uh, attitudes and motivation, motivations, the social psychological variables become very important in the case of uh, second language acquisition and are far more accessible in the case of adults than in the case of, of children. So uh, do we, how do we now respond to the question does age really matter? This is a very common question discussed among teachers and, and by teacher educators. You know. Whenever you conduct a workshop, this question will definitely come up. When should we introduce this language? When should we introduce the third language? And so on and so forth. The fact of the matter is that these questions can be decided by extra linguistic factors, but not by inherent linguistic factors. Because you can introduce three languages if they are needed in society, if children and adults are motivated enough, and if their attitudes are positive, and if you know how to do your business, 
that how to transact the curriculum and the syllabi and the and the lessons in the classroom then you can do it so there is no ideal age of introducing x or y or z language okay. you are always ready you are always uh, in terms of universal grammar in terms of cognitive development you are always ready to learn unless you are you have become cognitively damaged you know that's a, that's a different phenomenon there is sort of one important dimension that we need to keep in mind and that important dimension is that uh, the the human vocal tract and the human jaw over a period of time becomes far more uh, rigid far more frozen you know as we grow older i get used to say i i think i discussed it in another uh, module also that you know it is difficult to approximate to the native like pronunciation of the target language and uh, in the acquisition i did not mention at that time but i am mentioning it now to you that in the acquisition of the target language it is not only the so called interference from the first language or the sort of rigidity of your jaw that has become habituated to one or two languages but it is also the transfer of training it depends what kind of language what kind of pronunciation your teacher is using if she is using if she is saying sakul or iskul then you can't say look this child can't even say the uh, simple consonant cluster together the child is not able to say that because nobody around her parents the society and the teacher and the friends all of them in in punjab they would say sakul and uh, in uh, in up or in uh, in bihar they would say iskul and that is what the child is going to do uh so in the domain of pronunciation yes there might be problems but in the domain of syntax in the domain of semantics in the domain of morphology uh it would seem that it is not worthwhile to uh make this kind of uh distinction between the uh, ability of children to uh, i mean the ability of children and adults to learn a second or a, or a third language uh we have already talked about you know which are relevant here also but i will not i don't wish to repeat them we have already talked about crashens sort of five or six hypotheses which are very central to second language acquisition and also the important case of gini which which doesn't show that that she could not pick up language she could have but she could not pick up language but the because the appropriate kind of input and trigger to her universal grammar was withheld from her at a critical period in that sense the critical period hypothesis is important that if you withhold the input and the trigger to the universal grammar in fact at any point of time you know i can't sort of say look you know this person i keep suppose you have kept in a person as an adult and the language spoken in the prison is german suppose however you are kept let us say for 3 years in complete isolation you know away from any so there are hundreds of people speaking german around you but you don't hear a word so you are not going to pick up german at all because although even though the universal grammar is there the trigger is not so trigger must be there whether you are an adult or you are a child once that trigger is given then the language begins to flow so that is the story of the relationship between critical period hypothesis and second language acquisition or second language learning thank you